common at its finest, it's in. I will switch to English because of international guests. And this would be the refractive surgery part. We will try not to bore you with uh, the standard treatments that perform uh, reasonably well uh, for the correction of the standard refractive errors, myopia, hyperopia, and astigmatism. And uh, we will try to focus more on recent uh, developments that will actually try to, to tackle problems that we haven't been very successful up to now. And uh, the first thing we will discuss is the presbyopia thing, which is actually eluding a definitive solution. Uh, there have been many different ways and different modalities uh, suggested to treat and tackle the presbyopia problem, the, the loss of accommodation, and try compensating for it. But all of the, the solutions up to now were actually compromises. And uh, there is a lot of room for new concepts into this. And I would like to welcome our esteemed colleague uh, from the US, uh, Dr. Korenfeld. Uh, good morning there. Thank you, sir. Good morning to you, or good afternoon, I think, where you are. Yes, exactly. So yes. we would like to hear, without any disruption on the long distance call, uh, what would be the actual prospects of dealing with presbyopia nowadays? Okay, well, first of all, let me, let me thank you and the Congress for inviting me to give uh, today's lecture and tomorrow's lecture. Uh, I, I think it's very interesting information and it's new information and it's very encouraging and promising uh, for, for the future understanding and, and treatment of people on the entire planet for the rest of time. So it's <laughs> no big deal. Um, I want to also mention before I start that I um, am a paid consultant and a principal investigator for Nor Novartis, who is the company that currently owns the drug asset that I will spend most of my time discussing. Uh, but they're not, they're not compensating me for doing this, so it's, I'm kind of an independent player. But before I start, I want to set the mood by playing guitar for a tiny bit so everybody can get a smile on their face and then we'll launch right into it. So here we go. Thank you very All much. Right. That was an excellent prelude to the talk. <laughs> Thank you. Let's let's get into it. Thank you. So the concept of presbyopia is tricky because it, it involves many different things. And most people think of presbyopia uh, as the loss of accommodative ability, which it is. But accommodation itself is trickier than most people realize. And when you accommodate, your, you converge, your eyes will, will cross, your pupil will get small, and the, most of the action is with the change in the uh, shape and position of the crystalline lens. But as, you, as time goes on and as you age, the accommodative mechanism or, changes. So the lens, the crystalline lens of the eye is uh, ectoderm, and all ectoderm in the body physically grows larger with time, which is why older people, their nose gets bigger and their ears get bigger. And of course, as the lens physically gets bigger, that means that the capsular surface gets closer to the ciliary muscle. And so the zonules have less distance with which to work. It also turns out that during this time, the ciliary muscle itself is undergoing a little atrophy. So it's getting farther away from the lens capsule which would offset a little bit the size of the lens growing, but not as much. And of course, 
the viscosity of the retina changes as the vitreous goes from a gel and undergoes synoresis and it becomes more watery. And it turns out a lot of the, the action of, uh, of accommodation at the lens is a transfer of muscular contraction uh, conveyed to the, uh, the, the crystalline lens, but also conveyed to the vitreous body which is a viscoelastic structure and acts like a spring. So as the, as the lens is drawn back against the vitreous face, there's some energy stored uh, not only within the vitreous gel, but within the retina and the choroid, which also have uh, a springy character. And so all of these things are taking place simultaneously as the lens itself becomes stiffer. So it is expected that even if you had a magical treatment that made the lens less stiff, more like it was when you were younger, you're not going to change the, the, the uh, tendency for the lens to get bigger, the ciliary muscle to become atrophic, and the vitreous becoming more liquidy. So there were um, many different approaches uh, to presbyopia. And as you correctly pointed out at the beginning, none of them are, are really very good. You have single vision uh, reading glasses, and then they had bifocals, and then they had no line bifocals. And then you're, for implants, there were uh, uh, the monovision structure, and then they had multifocals, and then they had a lens that they called accommodating, but it really didn't accommodate exactly, which is the crystal lens. Eventually, I think they're going to come up with a, uh, a material that is suitable to put into the lens capsule to fill, fill the bag all the way that will have similar uh, properties as to a young person's crystalline lens and maybe restore the, the, the full range or nearly the full range of lens uh, deformations during accommodation. However, it's possible, and I'm gonna show you why I think this, that there could possibly be a medicine that would prevent these things from, occur from occurring. I know that sounds kind of crazy, but it may not be so crazy. So if you had a, uh, a medicine, it would have to try and cause the stiffening of the lens with time to become less stiff. And so most of the stiffening of the lens is thought to occur because of oxidation of lens proteins within the lens fibers and the disulfide bonds that don't normally exist there form. And those disulfi disulfide bonds that cross between fibers kind of lock them so they do not have the same kind of, of movements that they normally would have under the mechanical forces that are imparted upon them by the uh, ciliary muscle and indirectly the zonules and the vitreous body. So the hypothesis has been if we had a way of breaking the disulfide bonds, would that restore greater uh, ability of the, uh, of the lens uh, proteins and the lens uh, cytosol to move against one another with greater um, facility and improve the uh, accommodative range? So in order to cause a disulfide bond to break, you have to introduce a reducing agent. And the reducing agent that you introduce has to get into the eye and cross the eye wall against the flow of the aqueous humor, which is, which is not always so very easy. Uh, a prodrug, one that had some chemical configuration that facilitated its transfer across the eye wall would be desirable. And of course, if you're gonna use a chemical that's a reducing agent, you have to store it in a environment where there isn't a bunch of oxygen because that would cause that reducing agent to lose its potency. So that, that's the challenge. So here's the solution, or here's one of the solutions. Lipoic acid is a known naturally occurring antioxidant uh, reducing agent. It's a natural substance, it's in the body, it's currently sold uh, as, as a supplement that you take as a pill. And so that was a candidate that was thought to be a good uh, antioxidant. However, getting that into the eye was uh, not as good as it, as it could be. So the very smart man, Dr. Garner, who uh, sort of invented this, decided that he would uh, esterify choline to the uh, lipoic acid molecule, 
which uh, f facilitates the, the penetration of the drug. And as it's going through the cornea, uh, the esterases in the cornea will liberate the lipoic acid into the anterior chamber. That's not the full story because lipoic acid isn't the actual active drug. What happens is the lipoic acid goes through the lens capsule, enters the uh, lens fibers, and the lens fibers process it further uh, by, by causing it to convert to dihydrolipoic acid. Uh, and it is that species that has the active uh, reducing cap capability uh, and can break the disulfide bonds. So once you have a chemical that makes a lot of sense, you have to have some kind of sense that it works. So the proof of concept initially was done with uh, lenses that had been removed from uh, animals and in uh, human cadavers. And the, uh, the chemical was found to cause uh, the, the lens to become softer and to become more round. And so the, the concentrations, at least in, in vivo, in, in animals and in vitro, in, in, in the human cadaver lenses were, were selected to come, come upon a concentration of the active drug that was tested in humans, which was a 1.5% concentration. And so this study was conducted and there, there are a bunch of my colleagues who, uh, who, are, who participated in this. And this study was done by using the, uh, the study medicine twice a day. Uh, initially, the, uh, the dose was in the non-dominant eye for a week to make sure that something crazy and untoward didn't happen, which thankfully it didn't. And once uh, it was clear that that was not gonna harm anybody, uh, the, the drug was dosed twice a day in both eyes for 90 days. So there was only a three month exposure to this drug. Uh, in the population, the people were between 45 and 55 years old. The distance corrected vision, the near vision distance corrected had to be worse than 2040. Uh, but the distance vision, the corrected distance vision had to be 2020 or better. And this company, uh, I think rightfully did a cycloplegic uh, refraction to make sure that the manifest refraction was within a half a diopter of the cycloplegic refraction. So there wasn't uh, over minus uh, distance uh, corrections, which would have fouled the analysis. When the study was performed, not only were they looking at, at efficacy, but they were looking at safety, uh, whether the distance vision was affected adversely, the pupil diameter, the eye pressure, all these things were checked. And I mentioned the pupil diameter because as you probably know, there's an entire class of presbyopia treating eye drops that are various sorts of meiotic agents like pilocarpine at various concentrations that primarily work to make the pupil smaller uh, and improve the depth of focus. But uh, this is an optical trick and doesn't do anything really to the, to the structure of the accommodative mechanism. It's sort of a bypass of sorts. Uh, and and it is, it's only as long as pilocarpine works. This is different. This drug is different. So in the study group, there were 25 placebo uh, controls, 50 active people. Uh, there, there were uh, men and women and people of different races and ethnicities. Uh, it, it was pretty well represented. It wasn't a, uh, a very sort of confined group of people that were studied. The results. So of course, a drug like this, you're hoping that it gives you improved uh, near distance corrected near vision, but you also hope it doesn't foul uh, other things that people are, are concerned about. And thankfully, the drug was found to be safe and well tolerated. Uh, no subjects were discontinued for any adverse events or safety concerns. There was no uh, change in the intraocular pressure. The drug was comfortable, uh, basically as comfortable as placebo was. Uh, there was no change in the distance uh, corrected uh, vision, which could have happened potentially, but it didn't happen. 
and there was no change in the refraction uh, e even when the eye was cycloplegic, and no change of the pupil diameter. Uh, the adverse events, uh, this details what they are, but there, there really wasn't anything that uh, was concerning to the, uh, the patients or the, the investigators. Uh, here's a sort of a graphic of the, the, the change. And I will walk you through this. The, the uh, first assessment was made in terms of near vision after just eight days of dosing. And uh, there was assessments made on day eight, 15, 31, 61, and 91. And the darker blue bar is the uh, representation of those people who were treated with the active drug. And the light blue bar is the one for the people that got the inactive drug. And you can see that even as early as day eight, there was already a separation between the treated people and the untreated people that actually was statistically significant. And as time went on, that the delta, the difference between the treated and the untreated people just got bigger and bigger. And if you look over here at this last time that the assessment was made uh, after the fullest duration of dosing, which again was, was 90 days, the uh, improvement, this, is, this right here would be two lines of, of uh, near distance corrected near vision. People are getting close to two lines of distance corrected near vision. And that's after 90 days of dosing. I, I will tell you, that this drug has never been used by, uh, by humans for longer than 90 days. And of course, if you see the slope of this line, which looks like it's getting better and better and better and better, uh, you wanna know what happens at 100 days and 200 days and 365 days. That isn't known just yet, but Novartis is hot on the trail to find out where that uh, effect stops. Uh, this is another uh, graphic looking at the uh, subjects who, who gained uh, greater than 10 letters of uh, distance corrected near vision. That's 10 letters of the, um, of the logmar scale, which is about two lines. Uh, and so you can see, again, over time, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And here's 50% of people who had uh, two lines of, of vision improvement uh, or better. At, uh, at three months of dosing. This is my favorite graphic of the whole, uh, the whole presentation. Uh, to walk you through this, this, this little sort of distribution graph here, this is how the patient started and this is how they finished. And you can see that the population shifted uh, meaningfully from 2050 uh, distance corrected near vision down to uh, somewhere in the 20, 25 to 2030 range, again, after just uh, three months of dosing. Uh, this is another uh, description that gives you an idea of the response rate. Uh, this is the placebo group and this is the active group. Uh, one line of vision, there was uh, considerably more people that got one line of vision, but nobody gets excited about one line of vision. Two lines of vision, the, there was more than a doubling of those who were treated. Three lines of vision, the FDA starts to get excited. Nobody got a three lines of vision and 22% of the treated group. And four lines of vision, there are even people in the treated group that, that got that. Uh, no loss of distance corrected uh, vision. And there are a very few people that had no change in their distance corrected near vision, unless of course you've got a placebo. Those, those guys, well, a lot of them did not have a change in their distance corrected near vision. So this drug uh, in this first exposure to people performed very well uh, all by itself, I mean, certainly relative to placebo, but if you had no placebo at all, the, the drug was, was clearly beneficial after, after three months of dosing, and it was well tolerated in terms of comfort, and it didn't cause any real problems with the things that people are, are concerned about, like their, their distance corrected vision, or their pupil size, or their eye pressure, 
So that sounds like a winner. So the next question was, if we stop dosing the drug, how long does that benefit that was acquired after 90 days of dosing, how long does that last? So there was a follow-on study. This is the study I'm showing you, and there's, there are my colleagues again. And this study asked the question, if you use the drug for, for 90 days, and then you just watch what happens with the assessment of distance corrected near vision, how, do, how does that play out. And so they took the patients, not everybody uh, participated from the first study, but a good number of, of them did. Of the 50 people that were in the active group, 34 of them were in the follow-on study. And of the 25 people in the placebo group, 18 of them were in the follow-on study. And the assessments were made after uh, five months after the dosing was stopped and seven months after the dosing was stopped to see how the accommodative gains had persisted. This is a uh, description of the demographics of the groups, which again are, are, are equally or you know, similarly distributed between the placebo and the active groups in this follow-on study. And so, in the follow-on study, nobody uh, discontinued because of adverse events. There was no change in the eye pressure. There was no change in the best corrected distance vision and no change in the refraction for the distance prescription. Here is the persistence of effect. Uh, this here is what I showed you at day 91, the people that gained what would have been approximately two lines of distance corrected near vision. This is the same, a smaller group, but the same group of people who had stopped dosing here and five months later were assessed. This is the difference between them who were treated and those who were not. And granted, this number is smaller than this number. So there was a decay of effect, some, and this is 301 days after the dosing had stopped and the difference between this and this, pretty, pretty small, maybe, maybe not different at all. And probably there is a difference between this and these two, but I believe that it would be fair to say that there is a residual effect from a, a, a finite duration of dosing that produces a desirable uh, endpoint uh, in people and, and what happens if you redose them or you were to dose them for a whole year? This is not known yet, but it is very exciting, very exciting. This again is a table that gives you a sense for uh, the two different groups. This, this here is the, uh, the, the findings that I showed you previously while the patients are being dosed. This is five months after dosing, and this is uh, seven months after dosing. And there's there, at five months, there's twice as many people that have one line of gain. There's like three times more that have two lines of gain. Uh, there's no fraction that you can do for this, but there's nobody who had three lines of gain after uh, five months. And, and so I think it's, it's, it's clear to see that there is a persisting effect of this uh, antioxidant drug that lasts longer than three months, and, and in fact, lasts a, a longer period of time than the dosing uh, actually took place. So these are the findings for this, this drug. Um, Novartis currently owns the, uh, the asset. Uh, the, uh, one of the challenges for the drug is it is uh, a reducing agent, so it must be formulated to be stable, and that means stable in the vessel in which delivers it. Uh, it means stable as you use it when air is exchanged potentially with the airspace inside, so Novartis has been working on that. Um, there is uh, currently a clinical trial that is a dose ranging study where the 1.5% concentration uh, is in the middle, and there is a uh, two concentrations that are higher and two concentrations that are lower. 
They are reproducing the 90 day uh, period because they will be able to, to reference the results against the, uh, the data that I just showed you uh, from the, the first study. And I believe that when they find that this drug is uh, still safe and effective, they should be able to come upon a concentration that produces uh, the best effect. And, and once they have that, they will uh, undoubtedly pursue such things as determining what happens if you use it for a longer time. And I, I'm very optimistic that this drug will become something that will be effective. Uh, it will likely get approved, but who knows? And, and then if, if, if the drug gets approved, I'm going to do a little speculation. And I guess this isn't quite off label because that doesn't mean anything in this setting, but it's, this, these are just my thoughts. This is not anybody's thoughts other than mine. I would submit to you that presbyopia is the first stage of nuclear sclerotic cataract formation, not cortical or PSC, but nuclear sclerosis is the senescence of the lens where it gets progressively uh, more cross-linked and physically gets harder and the refractive index goes up. I believe that if you were to treat presbyopia in an early stage or before presbyopia even starts, say in your late 30s, I believe that this plausibly could not only prevent presbyopia from occurring, and remember, the studies that, have, that are being done are designed to show a reversal of presbyopia, which probably has a bigger hurdle than preventing it because you, you have to break stuff. If you can actually prevent it from happening, that's probably an easier lift. But if you could cause presbyopia not to form or to reverse, I would hypothesize that that would plausibly either prevent or delay nuclear sclerotic cataract formation. And so if you say, wow, what, what, if you didn't form nuclear sclerotic cataracts, that's the form of cataract that most people uh, who develop a cataract get because it's the, usually the age related part. People who have diabetes and things like that, they get cortical cataracts and PSC cataracts. This wouldn't affect that because they have a different, a different uh, mechanism for their cataract formation. But if all of a sudden, this drug is, is approved and it works and it becomes widely available, the people that, uh, that make cataract surgery equipment and implants will become very sad. And the people that make uh, bifocals and, and progressive addition lenses will become very sad. Uh, and humanity, theoretically, with a drug like this could, could change for the rest of time. So I'm, I, I'm optimistic. I'm not saying that's going to happen, but, but that's, that's sort of uh, my, my, uh, my best hope for this drug. And so at this time, I would be happy to take any questions that anybody has from the audience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kornfeld. It's a very exciting concept. It's actually reversing the natural cross-linking of the uh, crystalline uh, fibers. And I can think of some contraindications on that on people that had already uh, keratorefractive surgery that might be prone to anectasia that would actually <coughs> kind of weakening uh, the structure of the collagen fibers as well but uh, this would be actually found at the long term, but it's, the concept is actually against the pseudo accommodating concepts of uh, the meiotic agents is definitely much more interesting and has many prospects into it. Uh, what I would like also to point out, it was uh, the, the placebo effect was not negligent, although it wasn't exactly uh, to, to the clinical relevance that actually the drug uh, is always out of performing the, the placebo, but uh, they were gaining some like two lines to, to a respectable percentage of the patient. So that shows that we can actually work around our problems as well at the early stages until 
medications like this are available or other good solutions. Are there any further questions from the audience? I want to respond to something that you just said, which, uh, which I've kind of thought about, but not in light of your insight. Um, when you think about the, uh, the patients who were enrolled in this, the people were all measured with distance corrected uh, near vision. And you mentioned keratoid refractive surgery. So assuming that keratoid refractive surgery did not leave the cornea in a vulnerable state so that a drug like this could cause ectasia, assuming that was not the case, you could take any person who had uh, a stable distance refraction, you could perform keratoid refractive surgery to cause their distance corrected vision to become small, I mean, I mean distance, distance correction prescription to become small or non-existent and then with the, uh, the simultaneous or subsequent use of this drug, they would have good uncorrected distance vision and preserved uh, accommodation ability uh, perhaps forever. So I don't know, I never thought about the collagen being altered and, and more vulnerable to uh, a drug like this. Uh, actually, I, I was thinking more of the opposite that an antioxidant drug that could get to the lens uh, if it was persistently available to the anterior segment, it might reverse other oxidative changes that are adverse, say in the trabecular meshwork, uh, and having that reverse might improve the outflow facility and maybe lower the, the eye pressure. I mean, you're, you're correct. We don't know any of this stuff and, and it would be uh, important to, to discover this uh, in a controlled way uh, so we know who, who would be a good candidate for this drug and, and who would not. Although the prospects are infinite. Yeah, mini monovision would probably bring uh, total freedom from glasses in all different distances, actually. And this right. would not be much of a problem for most of uh, the patients who underwent keratoid refractive surgery as well. So we will be out of business as refractive surgery. Well, <laughs> <or less. laughs> that, you know that, that is a, that's an issue, isn't it? So it's only time to tell, but it's obviously the most promising from everything that's on, on the market or in development at the moment. I agree. Yeah. Do you think I, if you give the drug for more than 91 days, let's say you give it for a year, that the, um, there will be a longer time that there's an improved uh, refraction afterwards? Well, it's not clear because uh, it hasn't been done. But if you, if you pr presume that in the beginning when you're a little baby that you don't have any or many disulfide bonds, if the drug is active and is a reducing agent or antioxidant, theoretically, it seems as long as the concentration of the antioxidant gets access to the oxidized tissues, that all the disulfide bonds could theoretically be broken and, and reverse time, in quotes, uh, to take you back to when you are uh, even younger than 30. So it's, it's not clear, but I, I don't see any re theoretical reason why if the tissue that's oxidized has a persistent uh, exposure to the antioxidant that works uh, for a, a lens that has a lot of disulfide bonds, why it wouldn't progressively cause them all to, to be reduced. So I, I, I would love to know that. And, and I think we will. I think that's going to come uh, over the next couple of years as Novartis sort of matures this, this, uh, this drug in, in trials. Good well, question. This comes from the fountain of youth then. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Turning back time uh, is a powerful thing. I will pass the microphone to Professor Palikers, who would like to comment. Good morning again. And uh, now I, I understand why you start your lecture uh, playing guitar. Uh, I think you, you give a message to us that we have to, to play, we have to learn to play guitar in order to survive because we, are, we have money after your discovery. <laughs> exactly. We have to have an alternative profession. <laughs> every, every little helps yes absolutely that's funny any more questions from the audience 
So thank you very much indeed. It was a pleasure and a privilege to have your talk and looking forward to the, your next talk. Well, thank and you again for inviting me to talk. Thank you for getting uh, the technology all hooked up. Uh, I'm very glad that it worked and I look forward to addressing your group tomorrow with another sort of uh, interesting and, and often not thought of uh, state of the eye. We're looking forward to it. And All right, now, take care, y'all. Enjoy the you. meeting. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you. Now it's a pleasure to pass the microphone to my uh, colleague, Dr. Kinigopoulos, to present one of our mentors and founders of refractive surgery and personal mentor as well, Professor Valikaris. Dear colleagues, it is a big honor to prologize our next speaker.